What's going on, dudes and dudettes? So, yes, it's pretty much completing what happened over the weekend with, like, Duke and the Chargers as well. Yes, Duke did beat the number one team in the region, Houston, 54-51 to 51 to advance to the Elite Eight. So, that was pretty cool to see. They definitely deserved that win. Yes, Houston did get one of their number one players injured during the game right before halftime, and he wasn't able to return, which probably helped out Duke, but obviously Duke was missing Caleb Foster, who's been pretty much their main starting freshman for the pretty much past month or so, so I guess you could say it's kind of even in the end, but <clears throat> he has very hard fault, which is kind of why I was a bit surprising to see the results of the next one, and I wasn't able to watch it because it was pretty busy that I was about to say April Fool's <laughs> Easter Sunday, but yes, they ended up losing to NC State, one of their in-state rivals, 64 to 76 in the Elite Eight, which um, excuse, yeah, in the Elite Eight, which pretty much sucked. And yeah, Jeremy Kane, the freshman, did have over 30 plus. I believe he had like a bunch of free throws and made a bunch of late threes, but it just wasn't, you know, good enough in the end to be able to come back in and get this victory. I know. They pretty much had their way, NC State did, during that second half of the game. Duke was kind of leading in the first half, but it just never really clicked. And Tyrese Proctor did not look really good as well, the sophomore. Filipowski, yeah, he's been playing out of position. He's usually a stretch power forward, but they've been playing him at center. So that's been kind of affecting him quite a bit, especially having to go up against that big guy, DJ Burns, for NC State. But... Yeah, I don't know what really happened with the senior Jeremy Roach or why didn't the other guy step up. Even Mark Mitchell, who was a five-star guy who came in a couple years ago, really hasn't developed into the guy. Everybody thought he would be even TJ Powers, another guy as well, a five-star that came in last year as a freshman. Hasn't really stepped up and lived up to that five-star status. But I don't know. We'll see how this team does. They're still going to get a bunch of hype next year because they have the number one player coming in and Cooper flag, but yet it's still kind of a bit, you know, premature in my mind because he should technically be, while he's at Duke, he should be a senior in high school because he did reclassify and is coming a year sooner. So I don't really expect him to be fully mature. Yes, he's one of the better players out there. He's probably already considered the number one draft pick in his, you know, draft class when it does happen after that first year at Duke. But yeah, Isaiah Evans is a really good player as well, small forward, but we've seen a lot of five-star guys come in, and they haven't really lived up to that status either. I know there might be a couple guys that might not end up signing or keeping that letter of intent with Duke because they might have to go to the transfer portal, get some certain positions that are more of a need and a little bit more of a veteran, older type of player to help them out instead of always trying to stick with these total freshman lineup. So we'll see how it goes, but yes, definitely. Looking forward to next year. This year was definitely very good, in my opinion. A little bit of ups and downs here and there, but still enjoyed it overall. And we'll see who ends up coming back and who doesn't. And a 2025 three-star edge did commit to Duke football over the weekend. Samson Onu Oha, hopefully I'm saying that correct, he did commit to Duke football, as I said, so yes, he's a, even though he's a three-star, pretty sure he's very talented, had some nice offers from some other nice schools as well, so looking forward to seeing what he can do in the near future for Duke football. And then, yes, the women's team did lose over the weekend as well. I believe it was a Sweet 16 to UConn. I think they lost that game 45-53, to 53. so yeah, a little bit closer than the men's and yeah, obviously that UConn team ended up going on to beat USC in the next round. Obviously, talked about that in my prior video. But, yeah, either way, it was a very big and good season for them. They had a lot of transfers and a lot of young girls on that roster, too. So, we'll see how they end up doing in the transfer portal. I know there's a Virginia Tech player, Amari, Amari something. She could have went to the draft, but ended up just entering into the portal. So we'll see what ends up happening with her. It won't be bad to steal another ACC player out there because she's used to competition and 
she's a very talented player as well, so hoping to see her on either USC's or Duke's roster when it comes to the women's side. And then I think I mentioned last week that Duke was having their pro day for the football team. And it turned out it was pretty big because all 32 teams were represented as well like how USC was. That's pretty cool that pretty much all the NFL was there to scout them and check them out. They definitely have a lot of talented guys this year. So that's pretty cool. Hoping to hear Duke's name being called out quite a bit during the NFL draft. And the Anaheim Ducks, yes, finally got a victory this season or the past couple of weeks against the Calgary Flames 5-3. to three. So I guess that's good for him, good for them, some type of momentum towards the end of this season. And yes, when it came to a lot of these Chargers, there's like a Kansas offensive lineman who's most likely going to play center. He recently met with the Chargers at that Big 12 Pro Day. A lot of these guys they either met in person at different spots with the Chargers or they're meeting virtually online or they're getting one of those visits because I think every player gets like a like 30 official visits to certain organizations. So we'll see how many of these guys are in person with the Chargers. Maybe that's how like, you know, important they are to the Chargers and who they might be drafting in the end. But there were a couple more players. There was a South Carolina tight end, Trey Knox. He met virtually with the Chargers. Ex-Michigan running back Blake Corum said he plans to visit with the Chargers. Obvious, the Michigan connection. The Chargers did sign a fullback slash tight end, Ben Mason, who was recently with the Ravens. They also, the kicker, Cameron Dicker, did sign his exclusive rights tender as well, which I believe was like that type of rights thing where if another team wanted to sign him they would have to give up a draft pick so it's obvious that the Chargers were really still high on him even though there's a new GM and culture coming in they still liked his progression so that's really good and obviously it's not that great of a contract but I'm sure they're going to be working on one more down the line in the future this season coming up so congrats to him. There was a Mississippi State cornerback Camarion Richardson. He is planning to visit with the Bolts or did visit with the Bolts somewhat recently, so that's good. Looking at some defensive guys from the SEC. And then, speaking of the SEC, yes, one of the top wide receivers in the class from LSU, Malik Neighbors, was recently on social media spotted in LA. I believe he touched down and was visiting with the Chargers, so that's pretty cool. Obviously, I would like to see him Maybe get drafted if Marvin Harrison Jr. ends up getting taken. I would still kind of like Brock Powers as well, but I think the Chargers are, in need, are more in need of a wide receiver than a tight end. So if they can't get Marvin Harrison Jr., then Malik Neighbors, then maybe a Brock Powers if you kind of have no choice, if nobody wants to trade with you. But if you can't get those two top options, then hopefully they will be able to trade back and recoup some more draft picks later that day or maybe in the future. You never know. But yes, definitely looking forward to seeing what ends up happening later this month. And yes, we'll end up on some miscellaneous news. Tom DeLong of Blink-182 and Angels and Airwaves recently posted within the last week or two on social media that he sold a TV series, a new TV series, to one of those networks out there. So obviously this one is in a little bit of more secrecy. Usually he kind of says which type of project it is and what it's involved, but this one he didn't really say. So I'm kind of wondering exactly where it is because I know we're still waiting on a Strange Times TV show from TBS, I believe, and some other, you know, companies that bought some of his shows, her ideas. So we'll see what ends up happening down in the future for his, you know, movie slash TV show entertainment career. But yes, he's definitely thriving right now with Blink-182 on their South American World Tour. So yes, thanks for watching, people. Like and subscribe. Comment down below. Let me know what y'all think. Have a great day. Bye.